Hey, have you noticed that all of the levels in Super Mario games end something like this? Threat neutralized! Hmm. <laughs> Welcome, welcome everybody, I'm Christian, this is Lazy Devs, and welcome to this tutorial, to this micro tutorial on how to do a circular, circular mask in Pico 8. This is something that I noticed a lot of people are trying to do in Pico 8, and it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, some of my students asked me this once, and I was like, oh man, do you really need it? <laughs> because... Uh, yeah, it's, it's not an obvious thing to do. Uh, what do I mean with circular mask? Well, maybe I will show some examples because you probably know what I'm talking about, but like picking the right name, like giving this thing a name is kind of difficult. So a circular mask is basically um, when you have a picture and then you cut out everything from the picture except from uh, like a circle. Basically, or like a different way of putting this is maybe like a stencil. So you have like a picture and you put black on top and you punch out a hole, right? That would be also a way to call this. Why would we want to do such a thing? Well, I think there's like two, maybe three important reasons of why this would be interesting. First of all, it's like a really nice graphical feature, um, kind of like reminiscent of um, old cartoons, like Looney Tunes cartoons, where it's like a really nice way to end a level or something, or end something, uh, where, you know, the circle comes down and becomes very small, and it's like this very cheeky, very lighthearted way of ending things. That's why it's usually you see it at the end of Super Mario games. It's also, it can be also used like in gameplay situations. So there's a lot of situations where you can create like, like a very moody, Kind of level where maybe the lights are off it's very dark so you just show a black screen and then you punch out a circle or like some kind of sprite like a shape and that's where your player is so you kind of like a um like a cone of light so to speak is following your your player as they're holding maybe a lamp inside a dark level and then, you know they cannot see that far so you only see like an area around your your player um that's something that you saw in um zelda a link to the past um so yeah, that's something that's also possible. And then, you know, once you can do these kind of things, you can go, you know, buck wild and you can just like also uh, create like uh, gameplay around these kind of uh, functionality. So I'm, you know, there's some really cool games that I, I can recommend to you, like independent games that are also trying to use kind of like a, um, a circular shape around the player or around different objects and uh, attaching gameplay to those kind of things. So there's really good reasons to try to do circular masks, but we don't have any built-in tools in Pico 8 to make this happen. So today, what I want to do is I want to show you not one method of doing this, I'm going to show you four methods of doing circular mask in Pico 8 and we're going to discuss like the pros and cons of those different methods. So before we um, can jump into different methods we have to kind of create like a workbench because we're going to approach this problem multiple times and I like to not just like to do it in a, like a vacuum I want to actually do it applied to an actual video game. And the video game I want to apply this to is uh, JLP. JLP is kind of like a little platformer, demo platformer made by Zep, the creator of Pico 8. And you can get it from, um, it's actually included in Pico 8. If you type in install demos, it installed demos into a folder called demos. So we're going to go CD demos uh, load JLP. And it looks like this. I'm gonna turn off the sound for this because it will drive us crazy because we're gonna run this program quite a lot in this tutorial series. Okay, we're gonna turn off the sound. Well, generally, I'm gonna prepare JLP right now to create our workbench, but I will also post all of the code in a thread on Lexolaffle, and this will include also this workbench. So if you don't want to waste time preparing the workbench, you can just download the code from the thread and just skip the section of the video. Um, but if you want to do everything, follow every step of the way, understand what is happening, then this is how I'm going to prepare the workbench. Hey, this is Christian from the future. Uh, you will be hearing from me a couple of times throughout this video. I will be helping out with a couple of details that Christian had, uh, you know, little oopsie doopsies with. And in this case, I will be talking about the files that you can download from the Lex Lovell thread. Uh, I made a little change there where I put all of the code 
that is relevant uh, for us, I put that in tab number zero. So it's not uh, like in a video where it's tab number seven, everything is gonna be in tab number zero. A uh, small change that should make things easier to find. Uh, otherwise, uh, let's move on. So first of all, I wanna create a new tab here. I created tab number seven, and I wanna call this circular mask. Um, in this thing, I want to create uh, two functions. I want to create a function called um, B4 draw. And I'm going to create another function called uh, after draw. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, and uh, I want to also create a, a, a variable called draw my bg and I'm gonna set it to false. What does it mean? I'm gonna explain in a second. Right, so I have two functions here and I want um, this function to be called before we draw the level and I want this function to be called after we draw the level. So I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna find the draw function. Uh, there we go. There's the draw function. Whole bunch of stuff happening here. Um, yeah, let's let's just put it in here. So here we're gonna call before draw, and I'm gonna mark it with my with a bunch of lines so we can find it later quickly. And then uh, we're gonna scroll here after draw sign, and here we're gonna call after draw. And again, a bunch of lines to um, to do some stuff. Okay. And then before the before draw, I want to do like an if statement here, if draw my BG, then now here is, I want to just draw some kind of remarkable background. I think the simplest way of doing this would be uh, CLS uh, 14. So we're just gonna create a pink background. Um, the idea is that we want to maybe create a, um, a thing where you know the, we draw something, we draw the level on top, but you can still see you know the, the what we drawn before shining through. Um, this is not going to be relevant for the first couple of methods, but it will be relevant later on. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to create like something that is like very uh, striking, which is going to be just a pink background. I think this is going to be uh, very striking. But actually, um, I actually went ahead a little bit and made like a heart background. So I'm just going to copy and paste some code and you can do it too. It's not that complicated. It's just like I'm clearing the screen, making it pink. And then I have a variable that I calculate from the current time. And I just draw a bunch of hearts on the screen with print statement and then using a bunch of math. It looks like this. The math is maybe a bit complicated, but uh, this is completely not necessary. This is just like, <laughs> you know, just like making things look pretty. All right, there's one more thing that we need to do, and that is going to be we have to um, actually look for clip statements because we we're going to use clip a lot. And I want to make sure that if we uh, if there's clip statements that uh, they are not interfering with our clip statement. And I think this is here in draw world, right? There's a huge clip statement, and that clip statement is for like split screen uh, things. So uh, you, I want you to find the um, the function draw world, and just want to want you to comment out this clip statement here. That's it. That's gotta be it. Now I'm gonna move out of the directory. I'm gonna save this as um, workbench. I'm gonna run this. Right now, nothing happens. There is still something that we need to do. Well, a little bit. So, well, let's just let's see. Let's just put something on the screen, right? Right. So let's just see if this works. I'm gonna go circ uh, 10, 10, 20, whatever, eight. Okay, there's a circle, that's good. Let's make sure that if we draw a circle before we draw the level, that that circle is not visible. Let, let's put it somewhere else. We see still one circle, that's good. Now, I am going to clip the screen here. This is something that we want to do. Um, so clip is a statement that is doing exactly what we're doing right now, except it's square. And we want it to be round. So let's see if we can make at least the square work, right? So it's like, let's go 10, 10, 20, 20. 
Hey, future Christian here with another assist. Something that past Christian has forgotten to mention is what kind of arguments the clipping function takes, and that is going to be the x position of the top left corner of the rectangle, uh, the y position of the top left corner of the rectangle, but then the width of the rectangle and the height of the rectangle. This is actually the width and height uh, part are actually quite different from the way it's done with um, the rectfill function. So that's something to keep in mind here. Uh, otherwise, let's move on. Right. So now, uh, yeah, this worked. <laughs> Uh, let us put it a little bit further down so we can see if this see oh I'm a bit too too far down. Let's put it somewhere here. Ah, oh, a bit too much. We need to find it. Okay, so you can see that ah there's GLP, right? So uh, we draw the entire level, but instead of drawing it on the entire screen, we just uh, pick a small section of the screen and we just draw inside the section. Everything that is drawn outside of that that little little space that we defined just doesn't appear. It's just like we constrain all of the drawing in, in a small area. Uh, but then, you know, clip is later and reset to the whole screen. That's why the red circle after afterwards appears. Right, but again, we said that we want this clip, uh, we want this our circle to appear around the player. And I have some math. I had to like dig in a little bit to see, you know, where, where the player is saved, where the player's position is saved and how things work. I have some code I can just plop in here and you should also copy this code in here. So my X and my Y is going to be the center of our, our circle, where we want our circle to appear. And then and this stuff is just dragging different variables from, from JLP code and calculating the position, exactly the position of the sprite of JLP on the screen and putting it into my X and my Y as a global variable. Um, and now we can plug those in here. Now you can see um, the rectangle is now following JLP and the problem is that JLP is appearing in the top left corner. So um, I'm going to create a variable called my, my r. Uh, my r is going to be the radius of the circle that we're going to draw. We're going to set it to 16 uh, and then we're going to uh, go my x minus my r, my y minus my r, and my r times 2, my r times 2. If we do something like this, you see now we have a beautiful rectangle following JLP. Now all that is left to do is to make sure that the circle that we're drawing here, the red circle, that it kind of like maybe matches the uh, the rectangle that we're drawing here. I'm going to do that real quick. My X, my Y, and my R. You see the circle is not quite matching the rectangle. You see how on the right side, on, on, the, on, the, on the bottom, it's kind of like, it's a bit bigger than the rectangle that we're drawing. That's why there's a, I, there's a secret, guys, about how circles work in Pico 8. Circles in Pico 8, I have always an uneven number uh, in width and height, uh, because you are always defining a radius and um, the center is not part of the radius basically like the radius gets added to this to the pixel in the center so you know you have like whatever number you type in as radius like say let's say two you have two on the one side two on the other side and a single pixel in the middle so in your circle is going to be five pixels in width in total um there is no way to do like a comma value for the radius it always like creates an integer out of that so if you put 1.5 it will be a circle with a radius one so whatever circle you ever draw in Pico 8 using the circle function will always have an uneven uh, size. Uh, and so the way to fix this is just we're going to put a plus one when we draw our rectangle for now. And then we just make a rectangle one pixel bigger a little bit so, so it matches the circle that we're drawing. Okay, this was fast, I know. But again, if I lost you somewhere along the line, there's going to be a link in the doobly-doo where you can just download this 
and and we can get started. This is just like our workbench. This is just what we need to get kind of like experimenting with this. Hey, this is Christian from the future again. Uh, something I wanted to add here is that Christian from the past has completely forgotten about the hearts. So that's something I want to show off. So um, this draw my BG variable controls uh, whether the hearts appear or not. So regularly, if you run this and it's set to false, you won't see any hearts. But if you set it this to true, you will see the beautiful, beautiful hearts. Why is this relevant? Well, because it shows off a very important ability or quality of the clipping function. The clipping function restricts all of the drawing that is happening into a small rectangle, but it doesn't just show black on the outside of that. It doesn't delete the screen. It actually keeps whatever was on the screen before around and uh, whatever is drawn afterwards is just limited to a rectangle. But on the outside, you still see whatever was on the screen there before. So uh, if we don't draw any hearts on the screen, you will see black because the screen will be empty. Um, but if you draw some hearts and then you do the clip and then you draw JLP, you will still see some hearts in the background here. This is gonna be important later on where we're gonna try to replicate this behavior uh, with our circle function. Otherwise, let's move on. All right, method number one, big dump sprite. Okay, so uh, all of the methods I'm gonna show you today are actually methods that I, I didn't come up with them. Some, I saw other people doing this. I'm just standing on the shoulders of giants. And in this case, the giants are actually my own students. So uh, this is actually a really cool trick that, um, so my students, as I said, my students in the game jam once asked me how to pull this off and I was like, Pfft. Man, I was like thinking of the very complicated solutions like, oh man, I have, we have to sit down, man. We have to, we have to figure this out. This is going to be, like, do you have, like, I, I'll come later and I will explain and we're going to talk to you through this. And they were like, no, it's fine. <laughs> we'll figure this out. And, uh, and they actually did figure it out in a very cool, cool way. So the game I'm talking about the, that they end up creating is called The Night of the Warm Slayer. Now, it is not the best game in the world. It was created during a uh, game jam, but it has good vibes. And the circle thing that they created, that's actually part of why I think this game is really cool. Um, so, um, so the way they do this is by creating, uh, like just making, just making, just, just putting a sprite on top of, of your thing, right? And then the rest is black and it's it's fine. It's, 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 it's like a very simple solution. So let me show you what I mean. I have like a, in JLP, we have like this little gap here and we can just make a circle in there. Uh, let's use red as a circle. Let's pick, uh, yeah, let's pick this. I'm just gonna draw a circle. Like, what's the big deal, right? Let's just draw a circle. Uh, because when you look at this, what we're looking at here is like we already have the square. And all what we need to do in order to achieve our goal is to just fill in those those uh, round edges, right? So it just like becomes a circle, like the square becomes a circle. Like what's just draw just draw a, draw a sprite, man? Like come on, it's a game jam. We have to get going. <laughs> we don't have time for math. Um, okay, so we're gonna do an SPR. Um, the SPR uh, starts at forty-two. Um, let's go like this for now. Uh, my Y, uh, and that's it. That's 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 the thing. Oh yeah, we have to maybe also do like a uh, palt and the transparency. We're gonna turn zero to false. So palt zero false means that black is not transparent because we want the black to actually show up. Usually black is transparent, but not for in our case. And um, but now we want the red. To be transparent so we're gonna say eight is true just checking is red really eight yes if you hover over a uh, red you see in the lower corner that it's color number eight that's good and then also remember to always reset palt uh, transparency to uh, standards defaults after we're done so you see we there there is it it's it's um it's not quite it's not the full sprite uh, so we need to go comma two comma two because the sprite is two times like it's not just one sprite it's it's a it's a block of two sprites right two in width and two in height. Okay, there it is. There it is. The sprite. It's not quite at the place where we need it to be. Uh, so we need to move things around. Uh, here, um, my radius. We're gonna set it down to eight um, because it's two sprites. 
that's 16 pixels, but it's the radius. So it's not the diameter, it's the radius. The radius is half the diameter. So instead of 16 pixels, we have to set it down to eight pixels and that will match the size of the, of the sprite. Uh, we just need to now, it's like it's in the middle of the, of the, of the gap. We need to move it to the left and, and upwards. Uh, so we're just gonna do this, minus eight, minus eight. Now the the square is still too wide, and that's because of the thing that I talked about. Um, in this one specific case, uh, we just want to remove the plus one here, remove the plus one, and now the rectangle now matches the sprite that we draw on top perfectly, and so it just looks like a circle around Jelpy. Hey! This is not satisfying, obviously. This is, just, what is this? This is like a tiny circle. This is barely bigger than our character. Can we, can we make a bigger circle, please? This is, this is too small. Now, of course, the simple solution is just to use more sprite space. But in this case, we don't have like maybe, maybe this sprites here, like, right? The, maybe these would be okay. But then you would have to like assemble the sprite of the other sprites. Can we use the sprites more efficiently is what I'm asking. And yes, of course we can. Because if you see a circle, you know, a circle is kind of like, like if you look at all the sprites here that we're clicking on, right? All those sprites are basically the same sprites just flipped in different directions. So we really just need one of those, right? We just need this sprite and just flip it like this and then flip it like this, you know, and then we can create a circle out of just a quarter circle. So we can just make a huge quarter circle in this space and just use flipping to 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 make a bigger circle out of out of this spice uh, sprite. And I prepared something here. I'm just gonna drop it in here. Bam! I just drag and drop a PNG file. You can do that. You can just drag and drop PNG files. And um, yeah, I prepared this in a painting program. You can also mess around here with a with a drawing program here in Pico H. Just you know make something like really big like this and then create a huge circle and then copy and paste but I just didn't want to mess around <laughs> in the sprite map here. You will figure this out. You can make, you can just do it by hand. It's fine. By the way, it's almost Chinese New Year. That's why sometimes you might hear explosions outside. Okay, so now that we have this, let's run this and you can see, okay, we have the quarter circle, but obviously we want uh, it to turn into, like we want to add the three missing segments of the circle now. Uh, and also this entire thing is now way bigger. So we turn a eight to 16. So the square that we're filling is is now a lot bigger. So we have to like accommodate, like we have to make the square bigger now. Now we can see the sprite doesn't start at the right po uh, position. So here we're gonna go 16 instead of minus eight, we're gonna just go 16. So it's like tucked in a corner. There we go. One of the corners is rounded up. And then just do it step by step. We're gonna add one part. Um, we are going to go comma through to mirror it. And we're just gonna remove it the uh, minus 16 on the X coordinate. And that would put it square in the center, uh, like the top left corner of that sprite will be in the center. And that will align and we're gonna create this beautiful arc uh, in the top part. Now we're just gonna copy these two and I'm gonna paste in here. And we're gonna take care of the lower part of this. So first of all, we are going to do false here and then true to mirror it vertically. And then here we're also gonna go true, again, mirror it vertically. And then we have to deal with these um, uh, Y values. Again, we're just gonna remove the minus 16 for the Y values, but we're gonna keep around the minus 16 for the X value. Um, we just like basically shuffling them around a little bit so they're in the right space, um, spots. Perfection! Do, 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 do. Okay, so now we have a way, way bigger circle. This is this is actually, this is gameplay relevant now. This is actually, this is a circle that we can deal with, uh, work with. This is good. This is uh, juicy and nice. Looks pretty, very simple to do if you are if you just started with Pico 8 and you just know how to make sprites, you should be able to pull this off but what if we wanted our life to be a little bit more complicated? What if we wanted to, uh, because see, I mean, it's bigger, right? But it could be bigger yet. Like how, what if we could like define how big the sprite is? That would be pretty cool, right? 
Well, in this case, we have to scale the sprites. Like if you want to just like say, give me like a you know, arbitrary, arbitrary circle of an arbitrary size, and then we have to like make sure that the sprites are getting bigger. And the way to do this is SSPR, the special sprite, super sprite. All right, are you ready for this? Because this is gonna be it is gonna be a bit, a bit complicated. First of all, um, yeah, um, let's just set the this to thirty two. Let's just make sure it's thirty two. It's you know the square becomes very very big, and now the, the sprites that we draw in the center are no longer able to fill the entire rectangle. And now our job is now to scale those sprites that we just drawn. Scale and put SSPR with SSPR function, so they cover the entire hole, the entire square hole. Um, and yeah, just let's just let's just do it. Let's just, just do it. So SSPR works a little bit differently. So you have um, source x, source y. Just like to remember source x, source y, um, source width, source height. Just just decide. You know, like explaining where we're picking, uh, taking our pixels from on the sprite sheet. Then we have, uh, I think, destination X, destination Y, and then destination width and destination height, and then um, flip X and flip Y. A lot of variables go into SSPR. Now, the good thing about this is that all of the, 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 the first four variables are always going to be the same. Um, so I have this, so we have to check it out so it's like here the top left corner as you can see on the top left um, bottom left corner 80 and 16 we're going to put those into the first two slots so 18 and 16 now this is going to be 16 times 16 in size that's source x source y source width and source height now comes where we're putting the sprite uh, I'm actually gonna quote all of those other ones out. So just we to, we're just gonna focus on one sprite so far, okay? Uh, we're gonna use the my radius for this, uh, my r. So we're gonna go the x position. That's the center of the of the rectangle, and we're gonna just subtract the radius from it. And again for the y, the same thing. We're just gonna go the center of the of the rectangle, and we're gonna subtract the radius from it. That's gonna be the top left corner of the rectangle that we're drawing. Now the next things are um, destination height and destination width. Uh, we're just gonna put 16 and 16 for now. Just we, I just want to see something on a screen, right? <laughs> okay. So now you can see this rounded corner is exactly where we need it to be. It's just not big enough. It's just like a now we have created like an Apple icon, <laughs> iOS icon, or like part of it, an Apple iOS icon. We just need to scale this this um, this corner up so it becomes like a circle. And the way to do this is obviously just to put in a my r into the width and height, source width and source height of the sprite of the SSPR statement. Now you see it's pixelated, but it's certainly very, very rounded. And if we uh, continue this, uh, duplicate this for the uh, other three corners, then we should get a circle. All right, so let's try that. Just take this SSPR statement and we're just gonna paste it four times. And now comes the brain math uh, where we are gonna figure out where these things belong to. Okay, so this is gonna be top right corner. Top right corner. Uh, for this, I want to, uh, for the X coordinate, I'm gonna delete the my uh, minus my R. And uh, then here at the end, we're gonna add it true because we're gonna flip it horizontally. First uh, variable, first uh, argument is flipping horizontally, second is flipping vertically, just flipping it horizontally. Uh, let's just actually co comment the second two out and see if that worked. Okay, okay, okay. St one by one, let's go now um, bottom left corner. Bottom left is where the X stays the same because it's the same as the bottom, the upper left corner, um, but the y, we're just gonna remove the minus my r, and then we are gonna do false. We're not gonna flip horizontally, but we're gonna tr we're gonna say the true as the second argument here. We're gonna flip it vertically. Let's let's just run it. Okay, this looks almost good. 
And then uh, we are gonna continue here with the final statement, just removing the my r's from the x and y coordinates and going through, through to flip it horizontally and vertically. Okay, so this is our circle. Now, the circle is, the circle is pretty, pretty static, so I wanna see what happens if we animate the circle maybe a little bit. So, so we have more, you know, an idea of what scaling feels like. And I have a bit of a, I have a bit of a code here. So let's uh, do something like uh, my r is sine time. What happens if we do this? Well, okay, sine is is a function that returns minus one and one. So we want to multiply it by some number. Okay, okay. Most of the time we have a negative number coming out here. So maybe we should add something to this, right? So let's go 32 plus sine. Time. Okay, this is good, but now it's very, very fast. So let's go time here in, in, in the center here. Let's go time, let's divide it by eight inside the brackets of sine. After the brackets of the time uh, function, we divide it by eight, so it's a bit slower. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, and just to make sure, I'm gonna floor it. So we don't have comma values, so we just have like really nice integer values coming out of there. And yeah. Okay, this was method one. As you can see, sure, with the SSPR, it gets it can get very complicated. If you want, you know, your exact, you know, if you want a very custom size for your circle, then yeah, sure, you kind of have to like uh, do the uh, SSPR argument wrangling a little bit. But otherwise, it's just like in terms of complexity, in terms of what kind of things we're doing here, it's kind of easy. We're just drawing some sprites on the screen. There's no special <laughs> there's no special thing to it. It's just some sprites. They just need to go in the right places and it looks fine. Um, there's one, th one more thing I wanted to do. I want to pay attention to the performance. So let's, let's do, let me do a s control P and this weird um, performance graph comes out and it tells us how well, how, how fast uh, this program is performing. So we see we're drawing 30 frames per second. We are set, this program is set to 30 frames per second. And we have two numbers. Um, they're basically the same, almost zero point something, right? This is telling us, you know, how much time it took to render a frame. Um, when this number reaches one, it means that, you know, we no longer have time, enough time to render a frame to reach 30 frames per second. And then, you know, the display is going to get choppy. So this basically means that, you know, at in best case scenario, we are reaching 7% CPU load. And the worst case scenario is like, what, 0 0.5? 0 0.5, yeah. Why is it getting so much slower when the thing gets bigger, right? Like what's, okay, why would this compare to not drawing any circle at all? Let, let's, let's find this out. Okay, so you can see JLP just like straight from the box is 0 0.17, 0 0.18, something like this. And now something interesting happens. If we do the, just turn on the clip statement, just the clip statement, right? As you can see, oh, it gets faster. The clip statement make, makes everything actually faster and it gets slower when the clip statement gets bigger. So this is actually an interesting insight into, you know, how to make things go fast. Like if you create like a clipping region and you just draw the clipping region, even if you haven't changed the code of how the game is drawn, just because there's like all of the draw statements that happen outside of that clipping region just don't happen, that actually speeds up your game quite a lot. So we went from 0 0.18 all the way down to 0 uh, 0.07, just because the clipping regions got, got really, really small. All right, so if JLP without any, um, any mask runs at 0 0.18, and the worst our circular mask gets is 0 0.25, that's pretty good. It's okay. I mean, it adds some system load for sure, but otherwise it's fine. Like it's, um, it's hmm, we're gonna do some, we're gonna do some things now. 
But before we're going to do some things now, hi, here's Christian from the future again. Uh, something I forgot to mention is that with this method, you are not restricted to using circles as masks. Technically, you can very quickly and very easily use different shapes as well. You can just edit this sprite and turn this shape into any shape you want. So let me just quickly go in here and just draw some crazy shaping. Let's do a dot here, then maybe here, something like, you know, so really something really fun and then maybe here something, you know, you can do whatever you want here. You can run this and it will use this weird bug shape as the mask now. So you can, again, you can define any kind of shape you want and use this as a mask. And this is not something that the other methods will easily allow. Obvious disadvantages of, of this method is that obviously it looks, it, it looks a bit janky it looks a bit ugly right it, it, you can see that the pix it gets all the way pixelated when you zoom when you zoom all the way in when, when you make the circle really really big so this may be for like a quick animation for something quick and dirty for you know a game jank kind of thing it's fine <clears throat> but if, if you want to have a lot of circles and then we you would have to use like a lot of screens uh, like sprite space for to make like really big circles so it looks doesn't pixel uh, quite as much or you have to maybe use a different method. And by the way, that's another problem with this method is that you have to use bright space for something that you could maybe generate procedurally. Maybe you don't need the sprite space. Wouldn't be that neat. Can we figure out a way of making this work without sprites? Method number two, drawing a bunch of circles. Let us do some clean up. I'm gonna draw a circle in this uh, again in the center as we had it before. So my X, my R, my uh, whip, my my Y, my, and my R, and we're gonna make it red. And again, uh, um, there's less little fix that we need to do now. The circle is a little bit too big, so we're gonna do a. Uh, uh, no, the circles. Yeah, the circle is too big. The square is too small, so we're gonna add a plus one on the width and height of the clipping region. So the clipping region matches our circle perfectly. Here's my here's my thinking. What if we just draw a black circle, like instead of the uh, red circle that we have here, why don't we just draw a bunch of black circles, starting with, a, with, a, with this and then just making it bigger and then cover the edges like this, just do it like a bunch of circle statements. What, what, what's, what's the harm in that? <laughs> well, let's let's just do it. Let's just do a for statement uh, statement for you know, equals zero to let's let's just draw twenty. Let's go let's go to ten circles. Ten circles, right? Twenty was a bit much. Come on. Um, and then what we're gonna do? We start at zero and we end at ten. And with the radius, we're just gonna add i to the radius. So we're gonna go. Uh, we draw ten circles, and uh, each every time our radius gets plus one. So we're just gonna make the circles bigger. It's it's no problem. Hmm. Hmm. So you see, there's multiple problems here. First of all, there's huge gaps. There's huge artifacts in between there. This is not an even cover. There's there's holes right in between the circles that's bad and the second problem is that uh, sometimes we're drawing too many circles sometimes we're drawing too few circles so um, that's also an issue but that maybe that's not quite as problematic let's just f figure out the gaps thing and again this is something that i dismissed this method before i was like okay we will just get a bunch of the gaps why are we getting the gaps um rounding errors so how are we going to fill those gaps I saw this on Twitter by uh, Alex Craig was working on a game like this and I saw them using this method and it didn't have any gaps. I was like, what? How did you avoid this? And they had an excellent solution for this. I mm, I like this a lot. I, I was like, oh. Uh, we just draw a second circle and we're just gonna add one to the X coordinate. That's it. And you get an even fill. How cool is that? Okay, so basically, like just drawing two circles of the same size and just make, moving the second circle just makes out um, turns in. in well, we can just draw one circle just to show you what I mean. It's just a bit of thicker circle, 
And that, th that additional thickness um, is enough to fill in the gaps between, between the different circles. So we're just drawing a whole bunch of circles now uh, and it's great. It's, it just fills all of the gaps and, and, and we're happy and we're a happy camper. That's really good. However, there's still the problem that sometimes we're drawing too many circles and sometimes we're drawing not enough circles. How are we going to address this problem? Well, the problem is here. The problem is with the 20 here. That's the 20 has to be kind of like, we have to make the 20 go higher. We have to draw more circles if we are covering a bigger rectangle and less circle if we are tr trying to cover a smaller rectangle. Um, this is something, I, it's just, I did some experiments. Um, so I, I just put in my R and I by divide by two. That seems like a good number. Uh, and I do a floor just, just, to, just, just to be sure. So floor my R, that's the radius of the circle. Uh, divided by two and that gives you a kind of a good fill that kind of looks okay i think now uh, we're not going to draw um, red circles that's the eight here at the end we're going to turn them into black circles and you can see ah beautiful Mwah. now for now i want to also look at the uh, performance here uh, so if we look at this, so in the 0 0.7 uh, for the fastest performance for like a really small circle. And if it goes all the way up, we see um, 0 0.29. I'm going to write this down. So this second method, just drawing a bunch of circles, is a little bit slower than, than uh, drawing a sprite. But obviously the huge advantage here is that we are not using any sprites. This works without any sprites. It looks really nice and, and crisp, even at a bigger uh, resolution. So this is also really nice. Um, the circle is not perfectly circle because we moved the circles. It's a little bit, uh, you know, egg shaped now. Mm, that's OK. You know, it's it's barely perceptible, I think. But what if we wanted our life to be a little bit more complicated? Method number three is going to be using math. Are you ready for some math? No! Yeah, math. Let me show you some math. Ta-da! So I prepared this little, this little um, uh, tool here to kind of explain you what we're going to do. We are going to draw um, the the corners of of our circle. They kind of we fill in those corners not with any kind of like built-in function, or I guess we're gonna use a built-in function, but the built-in function that we're gonna use is the line statement. We're just gonna go every line, we're actually gonna use columns. We're gonna go every column of the circle, through every columns, uh, through every column of the circle. We're just gonna draw lines going upwards from the edge of the rectangle to the edge of the circle. We're just gonna go draw the, the lines and fill in the, um, um, the corners that way. And we're going to go from the bottom and from the top and that will fill in the, the edges. In order to do that, we need to calculate where the circle is, where the edge of the circle is. If you have a line I mean, at, the, at the edge of the, of the rectangle and we want to start a line um, at the edge of the rectangle and we're going to move it upwards until it hits the, uh, the circle, we want to know where that line will hit the circle. What, what is happening here? Well, I guess I have to explain this a little bit. We're going to create a graph. Uh, look at this graph. You should know this from math class. Um, the amazing thing about video games is that math becomes actually quite powerful and relevant, which usually math, it's not. Like if, you have, if you're in math class, usually people are like, oh, when would I, I ever need this in my life? I always loved math class. Because man, I was making games as a kid and was like, yes, this is very relevant to my interests. Finally, I know how to create, calculate the distance between two points on a grid. So, okay, so this is X and Y, right? I want to put it somewhere a circle, right? Uh, let's just make it a different color. Just so we're just going to put a circle somewhere on that graph and we should be able to, if we have X, if we, if we know this position, right? If we know this position, we want to know this position. We want to know where um the the x will collide with the y right on on the, on the circle if we have an x we want to find out where on this column where will the edge of the circle be 
where's the what's the y corresponding to the x if we want to describe a circle now just a circle somewhere off to the side is kind of stupid it's kind of not a good idea so what we are we're going to use the simplest possible circle and that's going to be a circle that is can we can, is that that's not possible okay let's just it's going to be a circle that it's, okay Okay, something like this. The circle that is like in the middle. The circle, uh, the center of the circle is at zero, zero, at the coordinate zero, zero. And it's gonna be a circle with a radius of one okay. uh, equals one. And if we create, draw that kind of circle on a graph, then we already know some points. For example, we know that this is gonna be X equals one and Y equals zero. That's pretty neat. We already know one of the coordinates. Maybe we can, we can make, we can derive everything from that, right? And we know that if x equals zero, uh, zero then y is going to be one. Because this line here, that's the radius, that's, the, that's one, right? And then we also know this position here, we know that if x equals minus one, uh, then y is also going to be zero. Now there's this whole bottom part of the circle. Let's just not think about this right now. Let's just ignore it for a while. So how do we like, but what if it happens if we want to like here, maybe it's like 0 0.7, if X is 0 0.7, you know, how do we, what, how do we find out where that is, right? Well, again, I was thinking about maybe sine and cosine and so forth, but actually the solution is Pythagoras. Diddy, our good old friend Pythagoras. Why is the Pythagoras uh, a programmer's best friend, a video game programmer's best friend? Well, because Pythagoras is often used to uh, find the distance between two points. Very simple thing. You have your spaceship and you have an enemy. This is, this is a ghost enemy. And you want to know how far those two are apart. What is the distance between those two, right? How do we figure this out? They are somewhere in space related to each other. How do we figure this out? Well, Pythagoras helps us here a lot. Uh, that's kind of like this old trick. We just draw a, 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 rec, a triangle, a right-sided triangle between uh, between those two. And this is the diagonal. This is the hypotenuse, I guess. That's the that's the technical term for this. And then you have side A and side B. And Pythagoras said, and then this is the side C. And P what Pythagoras said is uh, C squared equals A squared plus b squared and uh, this we can use this equation to calculate the distance between two points this is really nice we have like the if we take the horizontal distance that's a and the vertical distance that's b we can draw a root and do the math and <laughs> that's how you find the distance well we can use this kind of stuff now and we can apply it to here because in uh, our example we can uh, we can use this equation um, we know in this case that c equals 1. The radius of the circle is 1. So we can substitute and say like 1 equals 1 squared, I guess, but 1 squared is 1. So, so we can just keep it 1 equals a squared plus b squared. And that's really cool uh, because then we can solve this equation by a because a corresponds to x. This is x, right? This is x, also also known as a. So um, we can just rewrite this one equals x squared plus y squared because you know vertical is y in our graph. And then if you solve this by y, you get something like this. So y equals uh, uh, the square root. Oh god, I always hated the square root. I was always like, I don't even know. Please. Please don't hurt my family square root. Okay, so something like this. This would be like if we solve this equation, I, I hopefully. If not, I have to re-record re this video. <laughs> but I, let me let me check real quick. Yeah, it's 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 correct. So this is how we ar arrive at y. If we have an x, we can just plug an x into this this equation here. And then we're gonna get in a y, and that's how we're gonna uh, find out, you know, where if we draw a line from any position on the x, if we hit the red circle, where that that circle is gonna be. <clears throat> now, because of the x squared here, that's why this lower part of the circle kind of like gets disappeared. So we only get the arch over over that, and that's also why everything around, like everything outside of the circle, 
like all of the stuff here outside doesn't exist anymore um, because if you plug in if you plug in a number that is bigger than one into x then you will get negative number in the root and then <laughs> all all sorts of hell breaks loose <laughs> that's the math behind this okay that's that was the math Okay, and this is the, the math applied to a Pico 8 equation. I will post this in a thread as well, so you can check it out and, and play around with this. But yeah, this is basically the same equation that we had just now. Yeah, I always this, you can use, just move this around with the mouse and I always uh, display the X, that's the, uh, that's the dotted blue line and the Y, that's the dotted pink line. And the equation again, written in Pico 8, that's um, using as SQRT function, that's the square root. Um, then one minus an x times x is, you know, x to the uh, x squared. And now we can start drawing our function. So what we're going to have to do is going to take this function and we're going to start drawing vertical lines and we're going to use this function to figure out where the line has to end at any given point. And that's how we're going to hopefully fill in our corners. Let's try to figure this out. Hmm. Uh, I am going to go to tab number seven and uh, I am going to delete the old way of doing this. We are no longer these people. We are new people, new kind of people. We are going to do it in a completely different way. Okay, so we're just going to go F with a for loop and I'm just going to go for px, that's pixel x equals. Um, let's just go the entire screen, just like Print the entire screen, just like do it step by step. I just, I just, I, um, this is a complicated uh, piece of code and just want to make sure that we understand at, at every given point what is happening. And I'm just going to draw a line uh, at zero, no, at px dot zero dot uh, comma, and then now comes the destination again, px. And uh, I'm just going to go to whatever. I'm going to draw it in, in a red color. This should draw, you know, we draw a new bunch of lines on, on the top of the screen, just a bunch of lines on the top of the screen. Okay. Uh, and now what I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm drawing the lines on the top edge, on the top edge of a rectangle, not on the top edge of the screen, but I'm just going to bring them down. So they're always aligning with the rectangle. That's all I want to do for now. Okay, so uh, that means that we're going to have to deal with P -A P -Y. Um, I think we're just going to, um, for every line, this beginning point will going to be the same. So why not we just going to do a, like a local P Y. That's going to be my M Y Y. That's going to be the center of the rectangle minus my R. That's going to be the radius. And then I'm going to take this uh, variable, I'm going to plug it into zero here. And then plus one, whatever. Okay. Okay. We're getting there, guys. We're getting there. Don't worry. It's going to be fine. Just making sure that if we add plus one, that we actually, yeah, okay, that's good. That's good. We are actually doing it perfectly. Like, this is good. This is good. Okay. Good. 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 Now, we're drawing it with too many lines. So I want to make sure that I start and end like the 0 and 128. I want to just make sure that we are just starting at the left edge of the rectangle and then going all the way to the right edge of the rectangle, right? Just like making sure that we're not doing any unnecessary drawing. So um, let's go to the starting thing. So we're just going to go my, my x minus my r. Hey! Good, good. And then with the ending, it's gonna be the same thing. My X plus my R. Okay, so we're now drawing a bunch of little, tiny little lines on the top of the uh, edge of the rectangle. Now what we want to do, we want those lines reach further down and we want them to meet the circle. Right. So again, thinking about the equation we had, that equation went from minus one to plus one, right? That was the entire arc. That was the entire arc that we, we had spanned. 
but now, so we have to kind of take the numbers that we have here and we have to convert them. We have to math them around. So we're going to arrive at uh, like where we are on our circle, where a pixel coordinate that we have here, we have like pixel coordinate PX, the pixel coordinate that we're drawing on the screen. We have to take that coordinate and calculate where that pixel coordinate aligns with our circle in form of minus, like in a, in a range of minus one to one, right? <laughs> <laughs> on the range of minus one to one, where am I on a circle? <laughs> um, so yeah, let, let's we're gonna create a new variable. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna call this cval as circle value, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna see val, and just just, just just make it just make it just make it zero, okay? Just make it zero for now, or zero point five, whatever, zero point five, okay? So we're gonna take care of making sure that cval gets like math out into the right. Uh, variable, but before I go there, I want to just make sure that cval gets plugged into our line statement. So we start messing around with cval. We're gonna see, uh, you know, what's wrong and what's right, right? So let's just do a local um, ph. Um, that's a variable. Uh, it's pixel height. It's gonna be just like the pixel ph will save the height of the line that we're supposed to draw. And we're just gonna put a four in here for now. Just very simple steps. And then here, when we're actually drawing the line, instead of the one, we're just gonna put a pH, that just the height of the line. Okay, now the line got higher, right? And now we're gonna plug in Cval here. We're just gonna say, um, you know, whatever the results of our math will be, we're gonna take those results and we're gonna multiply them by my radius. And that's good because you see now the thickness of the line previously the line was always four pixels but now the line gets um, thinner as the radius gets smaller now that the line is relative to the radius of our circle that's good so far horizontal line though that's not really cool question from the future with our beautiful german paint so our task now is going to be to bridge those two worlds on the left side we have the nitty-gritty world of the actual screen on the right side, we have the untainted pure world of mathematics. And our bridge between the two worlds is going to be our variable cval. Where are we coming from and where are we going? Well, on the left side, uh, cval is currently 0 0.5, uh, but we will start with px. px is basically, you know, at every given point, the coordinate of the column that we're drawing. That's going to be px. We don't know what value px is. It's usually some crazy numbers. You know, maybe it's starting on the left side with 42 and it's going all the way up to 69. Crazy numbers, as I said. So what are we going to turn those numbers into? Well, we need to turn them into a minus one on the left side and a one on the right side. And there's going to be a little zero in the center. So minus one on the left side and a one on the right side. And if you draw a cute little graph here, I'm just going to draw a cute little graph. You will see that it will um, resemble kind of like a little little bow tie, basically. And there we have that little, little zero in the center. So we have to turn these kind of crazy numbers into a nice bow tie. Going straight from one to the other is a bit of a jump. So in situations like this, I find it a little bit easier to take like an intermediate step uh, to use a very familiar graph, which is one that starts at 0% and goes all the way to 100%, right? And if you graph that one out, it's just gonna be like this very simple uh, slope, right? So, um, so yeah, we basically turn C val first into like a percentage value. And then when we have this, going to the bow tie is gonna be a bit easier. One little tweak though, we are programmers, so we are not using 100%, we are just using one. So it's gonna be going from zero to one. All right, let's go. Okay, so right off the bat, I will um, kind of limit our animation. It's kind of driving, driving me crazy. So I will just, on the, on the top here, I will just write down um, my radius equals 16. So we always have like a very stable picture and we know what is going on. Then I'm gonna copy in some helper text that um, kind of shows us what Cval is on the left and on the right side of, um, of the of the square. Uh, you don't have to copy this text. This is just like some, some code for me to show you what is happening. But if you'd like to copy this, um, this code into your program, then, well, here you go. 
All right, so uh, do let's change that 0 0.5 into just px. Let's just plug px straight into Seval and just see what's happening here. And yeah, the numbers are really crazy. And the most uh, problematic thing is that when we run around, the numbers even change. So yeah, this is difficult. We need to rein those numbers in now. And the procedure is always the same. We're gonna start with the left side. And then when the left side is correct, then we're gonna change the right side. On the left side, we need to turn this 28 or whatever that number is gonna be, we're gonna turn that into a zero. So how are we going to do this? Well, on the left side, it's just like the number that the loop is starting out with, that px here in the loop, in a for loop, is starting out with. So it's this um, this sequence here, my x uh, minus my r. So we're just gonna take this and we just gonna uh, we just gonna subtract this. Uh, we're gonna put a little bracket around this so there's no confusion about what goes on first. We're gonna save this, we're gonna run this, and as you can see, it starts now out with zero, just what we wanted. Now let's move on to the right side. Now the, 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 fun, the good thing about this now is that the numbers are no longer changing. It's just like a solid 32 on the right side. So what, how are we gonna do this? Well, um, you will notice that maybe <laughs> that this is actually my radius times two. So on the right side is just, basically just equals to the diameter of our circle. Uh, we cannot subtract anymore because if we start subtracting even more, then that will mess up the left side of the equation. So what we have to do here is we have to divide. And um, I'm gonna write this real quick here. Seval equals Seval divided by, mm, whoop, divided by my r times two. Let's run this and that is our percentage graph that we wrote down, it's just upside down, but it's that concept, this idea going from zero to 100% across the width of the rectangle. Now going from this to the bow tie is exactly the same procedure. First, we're gonna take the left side and then we're gonna fix the right side. So we have to turn the zero at the beginning into a minus one. That was what the bow tie was all about. So we're just gonna go C val equals C val minus one. Let's run this and you can see minus one, perfect. Now we need to turn the right side into a plus one. This is a bit of a problem now because uh, usually we would multiply, but now on the right side we have a zero. So multiplying a zero won't change anything. We can still apply multiplication, we just have to watch out when exactly were we applying the multiplication. Multipl multiplying at the end obviously won't change anything, but if you multiply before we subtract, uh, for example by two, it means that Seval will turn from one on the right side to two, and then we subtract one, which means we will arrive at one again, and that will give us the desired result, the little bow tie that we were talking about. Ta-da! Okay, so now before moving on, let's do some cleanup. Uh, let us remove this radius here, this radius thing here, just um, you know, continue the animation as it was going on before. And then also we want to remove this um, text printing, the Seval printing, we don't need that anymore because now we can move on to the circle math. And now we feed Seval into our math. SQRT, one minus Seval times Seval. Okay, this is the, the, uh, the math that we've derived previously. Now we're using the equation to actually find out the curvature of the circle and we're drawing the line accordingly. It's correct, it's just flipped around. So let's just make a minus here. Mm, not quite what we want. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh -huh. Let us just do, how are we going to do this? Uh, let's go one minus like this. Yeah, it worked, okay, that's good. That's what we wanted. Now we need to draw a second line. Uh, we need to draw a bottom of the circle and that's basically be copying this kind of stuff and we are, let's see, what are we going to do? We're gonna do py plus my r times two. That's gonna be the end point. And then py plus my r plus pH, is that, is that how it works? Mm, not quite what we wanted. Uh, let's go minus pH 
and then my like this. Yes, this is what we want. Okay, um, p y plus my r times two. So the top edge of the rectangle plus twice the diameter. That's going to be the bottom edge of the rectangle, and then we subtract the length of the line that we calculated. That's going to be the beginning point, and then the end point is just going to be this again, the top edge of the screen twice the radius, the bottom edge of the screen. This is a lot of math. If this is confusing to you, that's because this is a lot of math. <laughs> but now this results in this very, very neat solution where we have um, the corners of the rectangle filled in with individual lines very precisely. Uh, and as you can see, this results in a very uh, efficient way of filling in this rectangle, right? We don't have any overdraw because previously we're drawing, for example, in method two, we're drawing a lot of circles and that kind of create like in a lot of circles that were kind of like going outside of the bounds of the rectangle but now we have um, lines that go exactly inside this rectangle that's really nice there's a bit of a let me put this let me turn this into zero and the two line statements zero zero so you can see like the results as, as they in, are intended to be now there is a bit of a Little detail here. You can see on the bottom of the circle there is a there is a little 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 thing there. Uh, that's a rounding error. Um, you can fix this rounding error. I think. How do I did it last time around? I think if we just go plus zero point one. Yeah, there we go. Uh, it's it's basically because that's, it's let's it's just like you can just also go zero zero one like it's it's just like um, this just one spot in the circle where um, the value jumps into the next pixel basically and just like by adding a little bit to, to that value we uh, we preventing the the jumping to be to happening it's 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 fine it's fine don't worry about this. If you are getting lost, then that's okay. Again, this I'm just like, now we're getting into the more complicated uh, versions of this function. And so don't worry about it. Just take your time, um, go through this function again. Um, just experiment yourself, see what happens when you when you change things around. Um, don't be intimidated by this. This is, this is, I always think about mm, math as like solving puzzles in video games, you know, when you watch somebody doing a let's play, right? And then they are playing Zelda and doing, doing some kind of dungeon, right? And then you quickly go to the toilet and come back and then you have no idea what's happening. What the current goal is, is like, I don't know. I didn't have a scene in this room. Why are we moving this chest? Why is this chest so important? When I came back in, you were just were fighting some dudes, but now we're moving some chest, why? And I think this problem is like, you really have to get your head into into the puzzle and when you are in the puzzle you are in control you know exactly what the current like sub goals are and so forth but if you are a bystander and you just like don't follow some kind of step uh, you miss some step and so forth it's very easy to get derailed um so yeah like i think solutions for math problems are just generally just like do it yourself make sure that you understand each step so you don't get derailed from the solution and then that's fine now let us do um the performance is actually the fastest method yet weird enough even though we're drawing so many individual lines this is the fastest method of doing this that we tried so far crazy right and this is exactly one payoff that's why we did all the math that's why we went through all of those steps because we are getting just this little bit of more performance however there's also another very 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 important reason why are we using this it's because now we can get really wild. What if the outside is not just black, but just like a darker shade? We can do that now. So if you have watched my previous video, uh, that was the review of the newest 2. Uh, 0.2.4 version. Now we have abilities to drawing from the screen back onto the screen and do maybe like a palette change. Now that we have full control of what gets drawn and what not gets drawn, like using the columns, we can use this new functionality to draw the entire screen, not just like the little edges of our circle, but like draw the entire screen back onto itself uh, using a palette change, but leave out a circle in the middle that will just stay the original palette. And that way 
we are going to get like this beautiful effect where the entire screen gets a bit darker, except this one circle in the middle. First of all, I don't want to just, uh, let me let me just turn it back to red lines so we know what we're drawing. First of all, all the effort that we did, it gets undone because we have to draw the entire screen now. So we're gonna start at zero and we're gonna go to 120, 127 is the, the last column, right? We're drawing the entire screen. And comment out the clip, clipping rectangle. We're gonna draw the entire screen because it is supposed to get darker now. Um, now here, when you're drawing the lines, uh, the X is okay, but PY, we're gonna start drawing the line at the top edge of the screen. Bam. Uh, and we're gonna continue drawing it all the way to the bottom edge of the screen. So down here, we are going to go 127. Oops, something went wrong. Something went very wrong. What did go, what, 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 what did, you, why, why is that the problem? 127, what? My, there's some my that we, what did we do? What did we do? Ah, I see. Uh, uh, my R, I did a mistake here. Okay, filling the entire screen with red. Now, instead of drawing the lines, we just wanna uh, now draw from the screen back onto the screen and do a palette change, right? So um, this is, hmm, hmm, yeah. Okay, let's try this. So uh, this is gonna be a poke. And again, you have to refer to uh, the previous video about, about the new version. Uh, it's gonna be a poke, 0x, 5f. Uh, five, four. Oh, uh, there we go. There we go. Five F five four. That's where the coordinates of the sprite sheet are. Usually it's at zero, but we're gonna set it to zero. X uh, six zero. That is the um, address of the screen. So now instead of drawing, when we do a sprite statement, we're not gonna take the sprites from the sprite sheet. We are going to actually take the contents of the screen. And of course, after everything is done, we're gonna reset it to default. So we're not gonna get into trouble. Uh, so that's uh, zero now. Let's run this, nothing changes. <laughs> and the reason nothing changes is because we're drawing line statements. What we want to do is we want to do uh, SSPR statements now because we there's like very thin SSPR slices. Uh, and in order to make things very easy for us, we're just gonna turn it into a function. So we're gonna go SSPR line, we're gonna call this like this, and just gonna go X, Y, uh, X, X1, I, Y1, uh, X2, Y2. And this function this is just gonna be a wrapper so we can uh, quickly convert those line statements that we already have into SSPR statements without uh, having to uh, do a lot of um, moving around. So uh, the source is gonna be at x1, y1. The width, because we are drawing horizontal one pixel slices, is gonna be one. Um, the height is gonna be x2 minus y1. I'm checking. I already wrote this function. I just mm, this is this is not something I will I will figure out uh, on the spot again. And then x1, y1. Very simple. Um, and then we're just going to replace this line the the line statement with SSP, SSPR line. And we can remove now the colors because the colors are no longer relevant. And this should plug in right in. Nothing changed, eh. <laughs> but now we are going to uh, bring in a, a palette change. And again, you can mess around and you add your own palette here. I have a palette prepared. Um, this is basically making all of the cards, uh, all of the colors a step a shade darker. If you run this, oh, perfect. Uh, there's a bit of a problem here. I think it's from the palette statement. Just let me remove the palette statement. Is that the problem? Why is it? Why does it look so weird? One, one thing that is a bit of a problem is that you see that there's a horizontal line before and after the circle, and that that's um, to do with the fact that you know outside of the circle we are still drawing lines, and they, I think they don't quite perfectly meet. 
Um, I think you can get around this problem by doing like a NIF statement and checking if we are outside of the circle, if our um, vertical line is not going to hit a circle at all. If you're outside of the range of the circle, just draw a huge line on the screen. Just don't do any math. It's just, it's, just, it's fine, right? So kind of like here, we're just going to do like an if statement, if cval, uh, if absolute value of cval uh, is greater than one. So it means we are outside of, it's either greater than minus one, uh, smaller than minus one or greater than one. Uh, then, and then we're going to do something. Otherwise, then do the math and draw the in two individual lines here. Something like this. And then if uh, we are outside of the circle, we're just going to draw uh, a huge, huge line. And that's, that's going to be it. That solved a lot of problems. There's, um, I think, another problem that we have here is that we just uh, simply haven't reset the palette. We're just going to reset the palette. Let's try that. If that's, yeah, that looks a lot better. Um, there is a line at the bottom of the screen, like uh, in the columns, the where the, the circle is. You can see that it doesn't, like the the line drawing doesn't go all the way down to the bottom edge of the screen. I think the um, SSPR is just like not doing quite a good job here. Um, I think if we just, like a very simple fix is just going to all the way to 128 here. And I think 20, 129 even. And that should fix that problem. And another problem is you can see that it gets really janky when the circle gets really small. So if the circle is zero diameter, I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna draw uh, lines here. So we're just gonna use this little if statement that we checked. Um, uh, for the columns that don't hit a circle, we're just going to draw a straight line and we're not going to care about anything. And uh, if my r equals zero, then we're also just going to draw a straight line. Yeah, past Christian, it doesn't quite look the way you expected it to, right? So let's just rewind real quick. Yeah, so this and here, that shouldn't be an and, this should be an or. Sadly, uh, past Christian won't realize this ever. And so for you people watching this, you should turn this and into an or. And that will look a lot better than whatever Christian has going on here. Anyway, moving on. Now there's a bit of a still of a problem. There's this dark line and that dark line came from our, our little hack that, uh, that that we added like 0 0.1 at some point to fix this little little thing in the center. If we remove this, the black line disappears. We, now we have like not quite of a round circle, but it solves the problem. All right, so this is what we wanted. So now we are not quite as efficient anymore. We are, this is a very, very slow program now. Um, we are because we are redrawing the entire screen uh, column by column using individual SSPR statements, 128, actually 256 SSPR statements. But now, as you can see, we can make things outside of the circle, not just get black, but a shade darker. That's really nice. <sighs> that now that we have this technique, now that we have this math, can we actually achieve uh, what I was talking about before? Like, okay, now we are showing something behind in, in the area, in the black area. Now we have something in the black area. But it's... Um, what if I wanted to show something completely different in the black area? What if I had some of my own image, um, like for example, the heart shapes in it previously, how would we want to make those heart shapes appear? What we're gonna have to do, and again, stuff that is new to 0 0.2.4, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to uh, save a screenshot in memory. We're gonna draw the hearts that we draw before. We're gonna put them into memory somewhere. Then we're going to draw the, the JLP level. Then we're going to take the hearts that we shaved as a, saved as a screenshot. We're going to take them and we're going to put them into the sprite sheet. We're going to put them into the sprite sheet. We're going to copy them. We're going to take the screenshot. We're going to put the screenshot in the sprite sheet. And from that sprite sheet, we're going to draw like here. We're going to draw the entire outside of the circle back onto the, onto the screen. And th this is going to be this, this, the hearts that we saved, the screenshot of the hearts. Okay, let's do this. 
Okay, so first of all, um, I want to draw the hearts. So I'm gonna set it this to true. Now hearts are being drawn. If you run this now, nothing changed because the hearts are being overwritten by uh, by the, the JLT stuff, right? Now um, here, before we draw, we are going to um, save the screenshot. We are going to use this function called memcpy, memcopy. We are going to use 0x8000. This is the destination. We are copying parts of the memory to a different part of the memory. Now, if you don't know what memory is, how memory works, I have a tutorial showing up here in the, in the corner. You should maybe watch that first before you dive into memory manipulation because you know this is getting a little bit weird now. But basically, um, the contents of the screen are saved somewhere in the memory and we're going to take that part of the memory and put in copy it to somewhere else and store it for a while. Now luckily with 0.2.4 we have a whole bunch of memory now starting at 0x8000. That's a whole bunch of free memory that is free for us to use and we're going to use that memory. So this is the destination, that's where we're copying uh, the, memory, the screenshot to. Now, this is now where we're copying it from. And 0x6000, that's where the, the screen is. And now we have to also say how much, how big of a memory block we're copying over. And that's going to be 0x2000, that's the size of the screen. That's how, much, how many uh, bytes we need to describe the screen. So now we made a copy of the, the screenshot of the of the screen, uh, and we put it in the address eight thousand. Okay. So this is happening before we draw the uh, the JLP stuff, and now when we draw the JLP stuff, it's going to be actually pretty pretty easy converting this. So now instead of a drawing from the screen, it's fine. We don't need this anymore. We can delete this now because we are just drawing from the sprite sheet as expected. Uh, nothing will change actually. Um, we are also not going to use the spal statement anymore. We are not going to modify um, uh, anything, the palette anymore. We are just going to copy things as they are. Uh, but uh, so if you run this now, hmm. I mean, we are drawing the sprite sheet to the screen for sure, uh, but we forgot the important part. We need to copy the screenshot that we have, we need to copy the screenshot into the sprite sheet now. And that's going to be, okay, uh, we're going to copy into zero, into the position zero, that's where the sprite sheet is. Uh, and we're going to copy it from the position where our screenshot is, that's 8000. And again, the same amount of bytes, uh, enough to describe the screen. And if you run this now, uh, This is amazing. Right. Uh, we wrote a bunch of stuff into the sprite sheet, uh, but now our sprite sheet is all messed up. How are we going to do the, deal with that? Uh, well, there's a very useful function to do this. It's called reload. You can just restore part of the memory to how it was before you messed it up and or just how it was supposed to be at the beginning of the program. And so we're going to go reload 0000x2000. Zero, zero, zero now zero, one of the zeros is the coordinates, uh, the address that we're restoring and 2000 is the size that we're just restoring. I'm not sure what the other zero is, but you know, okay. Ta-da! Okay, so this is now a true uh, a clipping statement works basically the same as the rectang rectangular clipping statement, which means you can combine two completely unrelated images. And now this is super useful. This is incredibly useful. Something, for example, you could do is now you can have like a Zelda style uh, light world and dark world, right? And you have like a level and then you make a second level that looks similar, but maybe everything is screwed up and, and mysterious and so forth. And then you render the, those two of those on top of each other uh, using this, this statement. So now you're walking around and everything looks nice and, and clean. But when you get close, everything gets like creepy and so forth because you have like some kind of maybe ghost vision and you can see the creepy world, you know, the, 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 the parallel universe, so to speak. There is a lot of options that you can do now. You can overlay things on top of each other. Really, really useful. However, yeah, ooh, 
yeah, yeah. Hmm, about mm, this, this costs a lot of. <laughs> mm, yeah, turns out doing a screenshot every frame mm, is is quite costly. So now we arrived at it stays quite consistent because it actually doesn't really matter because you know no matter how big the circle is, we are doing the screenshotting and so forth. So yeah, moving things around, moving a lot of memory around, will cost a lot of. Uh, performance yeah so for example if this was running in 60 uh, 60 frames per second we wouldn't be no longer running at 60 frames per second yikes so this was method number three as you can see a lot more complicated a lot more in-depth you have to do a lot of by hand there's a lot of math involved uh, it's initially it was faster so just if you just want to have like a black outline it's a lot faster and it's a lot more flexible. It allows you to do all sorts of really, really far out tricks, making things dark on the outside, combining two different images, really, really crazy. Cool, cool, cool. Now, what if we wanted our life to be not quite as complicated? In fact, what if we want our life to be a little bit more simpler? This is where method four comes in. Method four is doing even more shenanigans with memory. Let's remove this for now. But now that we started like doing shenanigans with memory, maybe we can uh, harness the awesome power of, of, of doing stuff with memory. And maybe we can, uh, we can make this work for us. Now again, the following is not something that I came up with. That's actually something that I saw somebody suggest on Twitter. Um, the user is called Nathal... Nalathni? Nalathni? Nalathni. I think it's a magic card. <laughs> Um, so they, um, so we were discussing um, the <clears throat> the little in a GIF of the two uh, zero point two point four. There was a GIF like with little fireflies, and we we're discussing this on Twitter how that effect was achieved. Well, that effect was actually achieved with a method number three, um, except not drawing outside, but drawing just the inside of the circle. And but we're discussing like maybe there's some other ways of achieving this, and they suggested. A method that is really cool. So the thinking here is, I don't want to use math to draw the circle. What if I don't use the math? I don't. Also, I don't like the slicing everything into tiny little SSPR statements because that seems like mm, it's it, it, it's. I mean, it was very fast, but it seems like very elab elaborate for what we're trying to do. What if I could just draw a circle? and like use this as some kind of stencil, right? What if I just could use the built-in circle function, circle fill function to make this work? And you can do that by using a similar trick that we just used, um, by uh, basically we take the sprite sheet and we're gonna fill this with black and then we're gonna draw a white circle in the center and then we're gonna take the entire sprite sheet, we're gonna draw the entire sprite sheet onto the screen and we're going to use white, we're going to set white as transparent. So everything that is black on the sprite sheet will get just like laid on top of the image that is on the screen. This is the idea. Okay, I'm going to set the draw my BG to false for now. We, don't worry, we're going to get there eventually. Um, so I will do a clip. No, I will totally clip. We're gonna use this mem copy statement. Uh, no, we're not gonna use this mem copy statement. And then here, okay. Um, so let us assist, let us start with the poke. So we're gonna gonna start. We want to start a drawing not on the screen. We want to start messing around with the sprite sheet. Therefore, what I want to do is I want to poke in zero x five f five five. That's the address that stores the address of where the sprite sheet is supposed to be. No, wait, that's not the, the, uh, the address of the sprite sheet. That's the address of the screen. Usually the screen is at 0x60. That's where we're drawing to. We're drawing to the screen usually. But now we're going to start drawing to the sprite sheet. So that's going to be the zero. Uh, and if we do something like this, we just want to make sure that they, at the end, we're going to reset this to, uh, to the, back to the screen. Okay, so this allows us to start the drawing directly to the sprite sheet. So now if we do a CLS zero, the sprite sheet will become completely black. Um, and at the end, if we do that, then we definitely at the end, we want to reset the sprite sheet as we did before. Let's run this. Nothing will change. No difference whatsoever because we don't do anything. We just clear the sprite sheet and then we reset it again. Nothing changes, right? 
Well, now things will change. Um, so I'm gonna keep this mem copy statement around because uh, it's easier uh, for me. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, for, I'm so forgetful about those things. So now we clear the sprite sheet. Let's just draw a circle. Circle fill, and we're just gonna draw it on the screen, like as if we had drawn on a screen. Uh, my x, my y, comma, my r, and it's gonna be white. Um, we are gonna do actually, we're gonna turn, for now, we are going to turn zero, the color black, we're gonna turn this to uh, opaque, not transparent. Uh, now, after we've drawn the circle, we are going to set the color seven, that's white, we're going to set it to transparent, true. Good. And now we're going to take this statement here. This statement resets everything to normal. Now we're drawing from the, if we do a sprite statement, we're going to draw from the sprite sheet back onto the screen, like, like usual. And now what I want to do, I, is I want to just do an SSPR, 0, 0, 128, 128, 0, 0. Just put it in the entire sprite sheet on, on the screen, like that. Ta-da! Perfect. Perfection. It, it's, I have some bad news when it comes to performance. As you can see in the top right corner, yeah, this is, this is not quite as slow as the previous one, but it's still not really great. So this is method number four, using a stencil in the sprite sheet and using whole sorts of, you know, uh, draw, screen drawing shenanigans. I love this method because it's like code wise, it's not complicated. Like, okay, yeah, what it's doing is a bit complicated. You have to get like into poking and so forth, but it's like not like the math version where you have to like, you know, do everything by hand. It's kind of like using built in functionality of Pico 8. It's not a lot of function calls. You could probably thin this out even more. And in the end, uh, it achieves like like a really nice and clean example. There is, for example, if the circle gets really small, it looks really nice and clean. And some of the versions that we had, some of the methods that we had, like the small circles never quite did look really great. Or you had like some uneven stray pixels on the edges. And now it's like really nice and clean. I love this method. Too bad it's a little bit more processing intensive. And again, like if we, this was running 60 frames per second, we would start seeing frame drops. So this is just for 30 frames per second, but still, but still. We could probably optimize this. We could, this SSPR statement, that's something that takes a lot of time. So something we could do at this point is we could probably not just copy the entire stencil over, but just like the circle, right? Just the circle shape that uh, that the region defined, for example, here by the clip statement, just we copy this little part of the circle over and not the entire screen. I will keep this around. I'm not gonna do this right now because I wanna keep this around for the next things that we're gonna do with this method, because this method can do all those things that method three could do. But before we get there, there is something amazing that this method also can do that the other methods were kind of struggling with. And that is we can have more than one circle. Look, we can just draw how many circles we want. We can just draw a circle at ten, coordinates 10, 10 with a radius of eight. Uh, oh, not sure why this didn't work. Am I? Am I taking crazy pills? Okay, um, so it seems the problem is the clipping function. It, I'm not sure why, like if I reset the clipping rectangle, it, it doesn't reset the cri cli cli clipping rectangle. I have to actually not clip it in the first place. I'm not sure exactly what's happening. I would love to for somebody to, to fill me in what is happening. But anyway, yeah, okay. So now we can draw multiple circles on the sprite sheet. And they will, you know, the level will poke through those circles as well. You know, you can see the level through those circles as well. We can draw a whole particle system of circles on the screen. And in fact, let me just do this real quick. So here's something we can do now. Um, 
I, I have something, I have like something, like you can really mess around with this now. For example, you can draw multiple concentric circles, for example. Uh, I'm going to draw a black circle here, and then we're going to draw a white circle again. And then now we get something like this. You know, we get really nice and complex shapes here. Right? Or we can draw again, like a whole uh, uh, particle system of circles. Something like this, you know. Uh, let's fill them. You know, it, you can, it, you can, whatever you can draw in black and white on onto the sprite sheet right now on the screen. I guess the screen is a sprite sheet now. So whatever you can draw on the screen that is just black and white will become the mask for the entire screen. So you can draw really nice and complicated shapes on the screen. You can even start um, technically adding. Um, uh, like sprites, but I guess now that you're using a sprite sheet, you can actually use sprites. So um, yeah, maybe not using sprites, but anyway, like yeah, whatever you can draw in black and white will become the mask, the stencil that is drawn on top, and that gives you like a lot of power. Something, you, for example, you can do now is, um, as we shown previously in a um, gameplay examples, you can have like multiple objects that shine line on a light on the level. So you could have like um, your, your character might be carrying a torch, but there may be also other stationary torches or the enemies themselves would have torches attached to them uh, you can have now really really complex lighting situations happening on the level now to close this up I'm want to use um, this method to not just show black in the background but actually again draw the entire level um, but with a palette change uh, so that's one thing that we're gonna do and as the final thing we're gonna do this thing with uh, with a hard background so there is a problem now that we just can't use the same procedure as with method three, because now everything works differently. Um, we are not drawing the screen anymore, right? Um, so we kind of have to think about this a bit differently. But again, the idea is always that we have something in our sprite sheet that we prepare that we just draw on top of the level that we have on the screen. So right now we're just drawing a black screen and then poking some white circles in there. What we want to do now is not to have the black screen, um, but actually a screenshot of, of what's already on the screen. And then we're going to poke circles in that. And then we're going to draw that back onto the screen. So here is the procedure. So we're going to go mem copy. We're going to take the screenshot of what, whatever is on the screen and we're going to put it in the sprite sheet. So zero. So the destination is zero. That's going to be the sprite sheet. The source is going to be six thousand. That's going to be the screen, and we are going to the size is going to be two thousand. That's the content of the screen. Now we're going to start drawing the sprite sheet. Now we're not going to clear the screen now, uh, but what we instead going to do is well, we're going to draw our circles. That's fine. Um, so we're going to draw the circles on top of our screenshot, and now. Um, when we do the SSPR statement, before we do the SSPR statement and draw everything back from the prepared stencil that we have back onto the screen, now we can do our palette change. And again, I'm just going to copy and paste this palette change because this is something I der derived experimentally. You can put your own palette change in here. That's fine. Uh, and that's going to be it. Hopefully. Yay! Uh, there's one problem. We're now not uh, resetting the palette, so I'm going to reset the palette at the end. And yeah, that's the thing. You can see that there's one problem here. The, um, we did like this trick where we had like concentric circles and one of the circles was black. And previously that, that worked, but now it no longer works because the outside of the circles that we are poking holes through, now it's not, not black. And so you can see like that this doesn't work. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it's the same phenomenon, the same effect. Uh, we are taking a screenshot, poking some holes in here, making everything darker and drawing it back on the screen. Uh, there's one more problem is that um, you know, obviously if something is already white, because using, we were using white as the color to poke holes into the screenshot. If there is something already in screenshot that is white, then obviously that would be a hole. Uh, you have to pay me, I guess, pick a color that would be the color that um, 
that is the stencil color, the, the cutout color. Um, but in this case, you know, it's just, you know, the mountains just stay white, I guess, right? Uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the clouds in the background, they just don't change color, they just stay white. Okay, how fast is this? Uh, it's basically the same speed as before, maybe even a bit slower. So let's use this final method to draw this hard background and, and make this appear in the dark area instead of just a screenshot of the level. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, obviously we are going to draw the hard background. That's for sure. And what I want to do now is this will go, uh, this, will, this, will, this will be more complicated now. So first of all, we are going to copy things from the screen into uh, some kind of, we're gonna save a screenshot in memory. So we are going, oh, wait, actually, actually wait, so this is wrong. So we're gonna go, go 0x8000, that's gonna be the place where our screenshot goes, like in our custom memory. Uh, we're gonna take it from the screen and we're gonna take the screen size. Now we're gonna draw the level. And now we are going to take this um, the screenshot that we saved and we're gonna put that screenshot into the sprite sheet. And then we're just gonna do everything as it was before. We don't do pa the palette change anymore. And that's gonna be it. That easy. It's like small variation on the same kind of thing. We can the same process every time. Now this is even slower. This is probably the slowest thing that we've we've done here, right? No, not quite. Method 3C was even slower. Uh, the additional slowness is now because now we're not just taking something from a screen and putting it into a sprite sheet, but we do it like we put another step in the way, taking from the screen, putting in the memory, and then taking from memory back in the sprite sheet. So there's two steps have involved where previously it was just one step. Right. This was a complicated tutorial. We went from very, very simple methods that just use sprites and circles, things that everybody uh, should be able to pull off. Then we did a very complicated method that used maths. And that was a very, very complicated thing. If you went, if you made it through method number three, then. Um, and then we went to this crazy method four that is uses, uses brand new functionality of Pico8 to truly, truly create really, really powerful code that is quite simple on the outside, but it gives you a lot of flexibility. Sadly, also bogs you down a little bit in terms of performance, but you know, there's a price to pay at every step of the way. As you can see, there's different methods. The different methods have pros and cons. Some of them are more flexible. Some of them are less flexible. Uh, some of them are faster. Some of them are slower. Some of them uses resources like sprites uh, on the sprite sheet. Uh, some of them don't use any sprite sheet at all. It's up to you to pick the one that uh, works for your project. Something that will help you picking the best method for your project is looking at the stats. So these are the performance stats that I wrote down while recording this video. So as you can see, uh, base JLP is 18%. Method one, two, and three aren't that much higher. And especially method three is really, really efficient. Now, once you start uh, adding all those special effects like the fake alpha transparency and the true clipping mask, things get a bit more difficult and that's something that you definitely should keep in mind. Same goes for method four, which is generally quite inefficient. Although I have to say in this case, we have quite a lot of room for improvement. I'm pretty sure that you can get this percentage down quite a bit if you invest some time in optimizing the code. Something I wanted to add is that I did not any do any kind of optimization for any of this code. Uh, I think optimization is works best when it's applied to a very specific case, when you have your code and you have your game that illuminates the level and so forth, and then you know what you're going to optimize for. So there's no token optimization here happening. There is also no speed optimization happening here. I think in a lot of cases you can make wonderful things happen. You can make things uh, speed up things a lot more if you you know know exactly what kind of thing this is applied to. You can make things go a lot faster. If you have suggestions of how to make things a lot better, if you have even have maybe a fifth method, I'm pretty sure there's a fifth method. I, I actually had an idea for a fifth, but I'm not gonna, it's, mm, this video is long enough as it is. Uh, so if you have your own methods, then post them down in the comment section or uh, post them down in the in the LexLoffle thread where I want to collect all of the methods in the LexLoffle thread. So we have a huge collection of how to pull off this specific trick. 
in different ways. Now, at this point, I also wanted to uh, make a shout out to all of my Kofi supporters. So this channel is supported by an excellent group of extraordinary people over at Kofi. You can see their names on the screen right now. This month, a warm welcome to my newest supporters, Creeperspeak, De Coxworth, Cheapshot, Zuren Cho, One Eared Rabbit, and Ooze Game. Quite an influx this month, which makes me super excited. Also, shout out to the veteran Donut Plus crew, Ted Carter, BB Samurai, Andrew Edstrom, Mario Carballo, Kevin Thompson, Makenai, Scott Goldsmith, Bresky, Emperor Snow, Knork, and all caps. Thank you so much for your support. And if you aren't a supporter and yet crave juicy details on the development of the next Schmap tutorial, you can become a supporter over at coffee.com slash lazydas and get that in-depth behind the scenes access. So thank you for watching this video. Thank you for sticking out with me. Uh, some of those methods that I introduced here might have been some more complicated, but I hope I have like a selection of different ways of solving this specific problem. And I'm pretty sure there's gonna be at least one method or two that work for you. If you have any questions, let me know. If you have any suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, see you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.